I'll never forget the moment I realized that the way I was practicing my chosen profession was wrong. I wish I could say that this epiphany had come when I was young and newly immersed in the field, but it didn't. I had been practicing for more than 20 years and even teaching these concepts to others before I began to realize that the conventional solutions I had learned were creating more problems than they solved. Have you ever looked at one of those black and white optical illusion drawings, the kind where you're asked which image you see? It's called a Rubens vase diagram, and it's a classic of human psychology. If you see the two faces and everyone around you sees only the two faces as well, it's easy to assume that that's all there is. But then suddenly, the way you see it flips. Now you're looking at that space in the middle, emerging as a strong, bold shape, instead of merely being part of the background. And we all know what happens next. Once you've seen the alternate view, you simply cannot unsee it. I was standing in front of this beautiful landscape, analyzing why it worked so well, when my own Rubens vase shift occurred. Suddenly, I understood. I saw the vase, which in this case means the lawn. What was different about this landscape was that the lawn was a planned, designed part of it, instead of just a generic foundation upon which to layer the other elements of the design. In landscape architecture school, I was taught to design any feature that a client could want, but I was never trained to design the shape of lawn. Lawn was just the filler between those flashier amenities, and as such, it tended to visually disappear. And therein lies the problem. In our area, Lawns consume more of our water supply than people do. I work for a water district that's charged with balancing supply against demand. So, if you were responsible to provide water to twice as many people with no additional new sources, what would you do? You'd probably do the same things we did. You'd sound the alarm, you'd share the facts, you'd research alternatives and then teach them to others. You'd spend your time, effort, and energy showing people how to change, telling them how good it will be for them, and assuring them that, in fact, they will learn to like it. <laughs> and you would be wrong, too. For all of our educating the public about water-wise principles, we weren't making much headway. The more we talked about the problem, the more we were perceived as the people exclusively responsible to solve it. The more we pushed, the more the public disengaged or pointed fingers of blame at others. We thought that with the ideals of Xeriscape, we were providing the needed solution. But to the public, the term Xeriscape conjures up images of <laughs> cactus and lava rock. Probably because, when filtered through our local dialect, eutonics, <laughs> it comes out the other side as Xeroscape. Oh, that is just so wrong. To locals, it felt like we were trying to force a style of landscaping they didn't understand, but knew they hated, all to solve a problem they didn't even think belonged to them in the first place, and they weren't buying it. That's not to say that locals don't care about the environment, it's just they didn't see the solution we were offering as a means to solve their landscape problems. Homeowners want landscapes that create great curb appeal. They want lots of ways to use and enjoy the yard while spending fewer hours maintaining it. They need sprinkler systems that work, privacy from those nosy neighbors, and plants that actually want to grow here. Most of all, a way of approaching their landscape that makes everything about it less overwhelming. Once we quit looking at the problem as we saw it and considered it instead through the lens of the homeowner, the true challenge became clear. Could we harness the power of design to draw these seemingly competing objectives into dynamic harmony? A true design-based solution would solve for both sets of concerns. Homeowners would enjoy lush, beautiful landscapes that met their needs while also requiring substantially less water to manage them. Energized by this challenge, our team of water, landscape design, horticulture, and maintenance experts began meeting with one goal in mind to take everything we thought we knew about landscaping, question it, turn it upside down, and boil it down to the lowest common denominator. The end result? Local landscapes, or as we call it, localscapes. 
Localscapes is not an abstract set of principles. It's a start-to-finish design solution that any homeowner can learn to apply. We've built some of the more complex aspects of landscaping automatically into the design, so you don't have to be a gardener to make this work. You just have to follow the five steps. Step number one, the central open shape. This is the distinguishing feature of a local scape that set it apart from all other landscape design styles. It's the organizing element around which the rest of the landscape is oriented. Arranging the lawn in this way creates a clean, crisp layout that's easy for sprinklers to irrigate efficiently and requires just a quick weekend mow and edge, conserving both water and your Saturday. For those who choose to forego lawn, a central open shape of gravel, hardscape, or ground cover provides the same design benefit while also avoiding the most common complaint we've heard about water-wise landscapes, the belief that they look messy and disorganized. Step number two, gathering areas. These are the social spaces where you'll interact with family and friends. We typically think of gathering areas as being backyard spaces, but don't limit yourself to a traditional placement. We recommend having at least three gathering areas, each serving a different function. Gathering areas not only make the landscape more inviting, they reduce the work and water required to keep it that way. Step number three, activity zones. These are the active spaces in the landscape for entertainment and exercise. Choose to fill your activity zones with a children's play set, vegetable gardens, sporting areas, whatever best meets your family's lifestyle. And because they're always placed outside the lawn, and they just might draw the family outdoors more often. Step number four, paths. Paths are made from gravel, hardscape, or even mulch, but they're never made from lawn. Paths guide users through the landscape and between potential activities. All paths introduce function, create curiosity, and connect the other parts of the landscape. Step number five, drip irrigated planting beds. Planting beds fill the gaps that remain after you've placed those first four elements, and this is precisely the opposite of how landscape design is typically accomplished. In a local scape, you'll never design the shape of a planting bed. It will evolve around those other elements, so it always provides just the right accent without disrupting the design. In new landscapes, it's easy to design this way up front. In existing yards, you'll start by removing those awkward bits of lawn in park strips and side yards. Then, carve away at the remaining lawn, adding gathering areas, activity zones, paths, and planting beds as you go until you've reduced the lawn and corralled it into a central open shape configuration. And yes, it takes some work to make this happen, but it can be completed in phases over time as budget and energy allow. We took the complexities of, of, of landscaping, focused them into the actionable framework of local scapes, began teaching it to the public, and then we held our breath. Could they do it correctly? And would it produce the provided benefits? We're pleased to say that many homeowners have since completed local scapes transformations. Even more exciting, Inspired by their great results, their neighbors have begun LocalScape's upgrades as well. This catchy solution can substantially improve the water efficiency of our communities without destroying their visual character. LocalScape enables each of us to have the landscape that works for us while using just one-third, or even less, of the water consumed by a typical yard. Through trial, error, and frustration, we've learned that we don't have to change people to create a more sustainable future. We need to utilize design to create solutions that incorporate values they already hold, solve problems they already know they have, and systemize it all in a way that's easy to understand and apply. Together, we can use design to solve the landscape problems of today and the water supply challenges of the future.